Hi, good evening. Welcome to our online evening service here at Charlotte Chapel on the 28th of March 2021. It's a, a real pleasure to have you here with us wherever it is that you're tuning in from. And we do have people from uh, all across the world. We want to extend a warm welcome to you. We will pray that you'll be blessed and encouraged as you hear God's word read and, and preached. Uh, and uh, as we pray, the spirit of the living God uh, ministers to you through what's going on here in our evening service. Um, just to introduce myself, my name's Ashley and I serve as one of the pastors in training here at, at Charlotte Chapel. Uh, in our congregation, um, we have many, many people, uh, maybe even yourself, that are suffering. Uh, whether it's through illness or bereavement, mental health issues uh, that are needing, that are in desperate need of comfort. We have many others in our congregation who have been the recipient of comfort given and so therefore are feeling strengthened by God's people. And so whatever category you fit into, whether it's one who is in need of comfort or whether one who has received comfort from others, um, we pray that this series that Liam will be continuing uh, over the course of the next few weeks and months in 2 Corinthians will be of supreme help to you. Uh, and like I say, whether you are uh, a comforter or whether you're the one who needs to be comforted, um, we uh, hold out the same hope, each one of us. Our hopes are fixed on the one in whom we find that comfort, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who himself uh, was rich but became poor for our sakes, the one whom uh, was afflicted so that we might be forgiven. He's our rock, he's our hope, he's the one in whom we find the greatest comfort and so we're going to turn now to to sing our praises to him, to worship him, uh, to think deeply about him as we sing our opening song. Let's turn to song now.
Amen. Let's um, take some time now to, to pray together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that when all is said and done, when we see you face to face in glory with our new resurrected bodies and the new creation, we will all proclaim with one voice that it was yet not I, not our strength, not our will, not our might, um, but it was the strength that we got in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. It was he who held us fast. It, it was to him who we looked uh, and he was the one who helped us through every trial, every tribulation, every suffering, every joy, all to the praise uh, of your name. And Lord, we want to say with the Apostle Paul that yet we work uh, tirelessly with all the energy that you work in us. And yet it would still be to your glory. Oh, Father, we're not in glory now, though. We are uh, still in this in-between part and we pray for your help. We pray that your spirit would strengthen us in the inner man and in the inner woman, that we would be filled with a, a real knowledge and a sense of your will, uh, that we would be strengthened in every work bearing fruit, uh, the good works that we do, the, the, uh, the characteristics that are developed within us and that we might uh, persevere for the sake of joy and for the sake of the glory of your name. And Lord, that you would even be pleased in and through us to bring others to a knowledge of this great uh, gospel truth of new life in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and of this future hope that's coming to all those who believe. And until that day, Lord, we pray that you would just strengthen us, that you would um, have your way amongst us as a church family. We pray particularly for those who might be struggling uh, and suffering in the fight. Lord, be their rock, be their help, be all that you have promised that you will be. Uh, and we um, pray all these things in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to uh, read the Bible now. Um, one of our church members, Charlie, is going to read to us from the book of Second Corinthians. So we'll turn to that Bible reading now. The Bible reading is taken from Second Corinthians, chapter one, verses one to eleven. Second Corinthians, chapter one, verses one to eleven. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we desp despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us, as he help us by our, your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Thanks for reading that, Charlie. Um, what we'll do just before Liam comes to preach from that passage that was read out 
uh, a moment ago, we'll, we'll pray. We'll pray for the needs here for ourselves as a church. We'll think more widely across this world uh, and we'll turn our eyes and our hearts and our ears as well to uh, the message that we're about to hear. So let's join together and let's pray. Father, we uh, want to come to you as your people, giving you praise and thanks for the wonderful plan of salvation where you have rescued men and women from the domain of darkness and you have brought us into the to your wonderful light, to the to the kingdom of your son who you love. And this was all a work of, of grace, of mercy. Uh, and Lord, uh, none of us deserve the least of it. But you're so rich in mercy and grace that you lavished your love upon us and that now we stand in Christ forgiven, redeemed and with great access to you as our father. Um, we thank you and we praise you that we can bring all of our burdens, all of our cares, all of our praises to you. Thank you that you're the creator and the sustainer of the universe and that there's nothing, nothing outside of your will, or your power, or your plan. You will even work the, the dark things, the painful things, the struggles for the good of all those who are trusting in your son and in your plans and in your purposes. And for that, we thank you. Father, we bring before you uh, our church family. There are many in our church family suffering, those who have recently been bereaved, those who um, whose loved ones are in the, the throes of death those who are silently struggling with mental health issues, anxiety, depression, those who are battling sins of, of addiction, whether it's to pornography or to food or to pride or whatever, any such thing. Lord, there are those that are struggling and the, the lockdown within this nation has only in many ways intensified these things by um, uh, separating the possibility of being able to gather as a church family and to receive the normal means of grace. And so, Lord, your people in many ways are harassed, battered and bruised. And so, Lord, we intercede now uh, and we pray that you would draw near by your spirit, that you would strengthen your people, that you would remind them of your promises to never leave them nor forsake them that even in the valley of the shadow of death that you are with them and that there's real truth that they they need not fear for the Lord Jesus Christ has uh, walked through death and now in his resurrected uh, power and by the spirit he can walk his people even through that darkest time. We thank you that by his blood he has overcome uh, the, the power that sin once had on people. And so we can now say no to the slavery of sin uh, and yes to slavery in Christ. Uh, and in and through the power of his resurrection, he can free us from addictions to everything. And so, Lord, uh, we pray that by your spirit, you would help those now that are wrestling with uh, the power of sin. And for those that are your people, you would show them uh, that Christ has overcome uh, and that you are powerful and that they would see freedom from these addictions, from these sin patterns and that they would find such joy and freedom in Christ. Lord, use us as your people. Bring to mind uh, as we pray each morning, as we pray in the evening, those to whom you want us to reach out to that we might encourage. And Lord, we pray that uh, as your people, we would shine forth like cities on a hill. And uh, that not only would we uh, bring great glory to your name by the way that we live and the way that we love others, uh, but you'd even be pleased to use us to bring others into this wonderful kingdom. Father, we think about our nation and uh, as we've prayed many times, we see that there are leaders in darkness. And yet we thank you for your common grace that we see. We think particularly of the, the judicial review that's gone through and we thank you that uh, uh, truth and goodness and uh, the the wonder of being able to gather has been upheld. We thank you for uh, Willie Phillip and others that have gone forth and taken this case forward. We thank you for Justice uh, Lord Braid uh, and Lord we pray that we would see um, uh, even greater freedoms and that this precedent uh, would be continued on into the future uh, and so that uh, the church wouldn't be closed and, and it wouldn't be made illegal to gather. 
And so we thank you for all that's gone on there. We pray that you continue pr to protect Willie and all those that are uh, working hard for this uh, for this case, protect him from the lies of the en enemy and the attacks that uh, will undoubtedly come. And Lord, we pray that we as your people will uh, once again be able to gather and sing your praises uh, in, in freedom and safety and to the glory of King Jesus. We pray for many of the things that are going through at the moment. We think of the gay conversion therapy um, discussion that's going through the Commons, the House of Commons. And we pray, Lord, that your people will still be able to proclaim the gospel, to um, apply your word to pastoral situations in order that we might uh, hold up your design for, for sexuality and for marriage and for freedom. And Lord, um, we turn now to the preaching of your word. We thank you for your servant Liam we thank you for the way that you have gifted him the way that you rescued him from darkness and brought him into light and now the way that you are using him uh, in his afflictions and in his struggles to comfort us as your people and we pray that this word that he will preach will go out with power uh, and conviction to your people that we will be built up that we will be comforted and uh, that we will hear you speak and that we will come to a greater knowledge of who you are your love for us and the plans that you have for us so lord um we pray that you'll be glorified in this uh your day and we pray all these things in the name of the lord jesus christ amen and right now we'll go over to our associate pastor liam who's going to preach from uh, second corinthians we'll turn to that now Susan and Charlie were chatting as they walked off their Sunday lunch. They weren't talking about the sermon, they were talking about the pastor, John. Now he's not that impressive, is he, says Susan. He fumbles his words, relies on his notes, lacks any oomph. Yep, said Charlie, and I wish he would stop talking about how everything's a struggle. Life's a struggle, marriage is a struggle, preaching's even a struggle. How is that going to do us any good, they moaned. Hyung Min and Mei are also out for a walk. Uh, they too were talking about Pastor John. Now Mei's been ill for weeks and the docs are suspicious. They were coy about her blood results but clear about the need for further tests. Sounds serious. Hyung Min looks at their three boys playing further up the track and hides a tear. He feels weak and worried. He doubts he has the strength to support Mei to help the boys or even to trust God. But May says, I really appreciated Pastor John's honesty this morning about his own struggles. It really helped me see how God cares for us in ours. Yes, says young men, it did me the world of good. Now these couples have different expectations of their pastor. <coughs> One expects him to be stoical, strong in himself, weakness hidden. The other expects him to be, well, biblical, weak in himself, but strong in God. Which one are we? It's an important question because God has chosen one of these to be the means by which he comforts and strengthens church members. Which one is it? The stoical one or the biblical one? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? It's going to be the biblical one. But 2 Corinthians 1, 4 to 11 says so. It says that, God strengthens suffering church members through the overflowing comfort he gives suffering church leaders who in their afflictions have learned to rely on God. That's my summary sentence for the whole passage. God strengthens suffering church members through the overflowing comfort he gives suffering church leaders who in their afflictions have learned to rely on God. Now, of course, like I said last time, this applies primarily to pastors, to church leaders, but the principles are secondarily true to all of us. God strengthens others in their suffering through the overflowing comfort that he gives us in ours as we learn to rely on God. Well, let's get into the passage, 2 Corinthians 1, 4b through to 11. And let's not forget the context that we walked through a couple of weeks ago. Paul's writing to this church in Corinth. He planted it seven years prior to this, but for four years he's been trying to recover it. 
fighting factions, false teachers and fornication led Paul to write four times and visit twice. It's not been pretty. But this letter is written to encourage the 80% who are repentant in their recovery as a gospel church and the 20% who are unrepentant to repent or meet the discipline of the apostle when he visits next. And last time in verses 1 to 4 we saw that God was introduced to us as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who is praiseworthy. Praiseworthy for who he is, God of all comfort. And praiseworthy for what he does. He kindly comforts us in all our troubles. Now the rest of the section, verses 4 to 11, provide two more reasons to praise him. And it's all to do with the method by which God chooses to comfort us all. And in this passage, we're going to see that the comfort God pours into pastors has a purpose, a purpose that serves the church, and the trouble he won't remove from pastors has a purpose, a purpose that serves them and the church. All of that has the combined effect of bringing God's praise. So let's get stuck into purpose number one, shall we? Purpose number one essentially is to comfort others, verses four to seven. Look with me, verse four. It says, uh, well, let's start from verse three. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that, there's a, here comes a purpose statement, okay? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we, comfort we ourselves receive from God. Now, I like to think in pictures, let me give you a picture to help us understand verse 4 before I take you through the logical flow of verses 5 to 7. And what I say the picture is, pastors serve like champagne pyramid. I know this is going to sound weird, right? But you know how a champagne pyramid works. Champagne is poured into a single glass at the top of the pyramid of glasses. The volume of champagne poured into the first glass is way more than it can take or need. The champagne then overflows, filling more and more glasses with the same champagne that was poured by the pourer into the first. And that's the effect that God intends the comfort he pours into church leaders to produce in church members. God fills church leaders and through them, God fills us all. Here's how the logic goes. Firstly, those who serve in gospel ministry, apostles primarily in here, and then church leaders, they share in what Paul calls in verse 5, the sufferings of Christ. That's not the atoning sufferings of Christ. He alone bore those. But the sufferings similar to his and suffered by church leaders for being his. Psychological pain, physical pain. Uh, sorry, physical pain, psychological stress, emotional burdens, spiritual aches are all part and parcel of Christian ministry. But the good news is, secondly, God comforts gospel ministers. That's what the text says. In troubles specific to gospel ministry, God pours an abundant, limitless, overflowing volume of comfort into their hearts. And remember, comfort means strength, uh, to come alongside, to speak strength into. And that's what God does with us. That's what God pours into gospel ministers. Next, thirdly, we see the gospel minister's comfort is then shared with those that they serve. So verse five calls it our comfort, the gospel minister's comfort, and rightly so, it is theirs. God gave it to them, it's theirs to share. And there's enough to go around everyone because fourthly, we find that shared strength leads to stronger faith in church members. Verse six says, if we are distressed, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same things we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Now you see what Paul's saying here. Don't miss it. He is saying, you, church family, will experience the same sufferings that we, church leaders, suffer. Physical pain, psychological stress, emotional burdens, spiritual aches are all part and parcel of following Christ. That means that 
you're as much in need of comfort and strength as any of your pastors are. The troubles, the distress, the sufferings mentioned in here are serious threats, you see, to our perseverance in the faith. How do we actually persevere? It's through the strength that God provides. And how does God provide it? Well, one of the ways is through the ministry of the leaders he appoints. That's why Paul says that he can see God's purpose in his afflictions and in his comfort through both the affliction and the comfort. God blesses his people and Paul says, do you know what? I'm fine with that. If it means salvation and endurance in them, he's happy with that. Now that's gospel ministry. That is biblical ministry. That is not stoical. Now what does this passage then say to church members and application? Four things really very briefly. First of all this is another reason to praise God. That's the primary application in this passage. Praise God who strengthens you in your suffering through the overflowing comfort that he gives to suffering church leaders. He is to be praised, right? He demonstrates his love through the shepherds he appoints to point people in church families to Christ. Secondly, let the Bible shape what you expect of your leaders. Susan and Charlie's expectations are shaped by their culture, not by the Bible. Shaped by what they think, not by what God thinks. But God will view their ill-informed rejection of their pastor and the comfort God intends to give them through him as a rejection of him and his comfort. That is not good. Thirdly, let the abounding comfort of God come to you through your leaders. Let your own suffering, like that of young men and may, create an openness to receive and not despise the weakness you may see or hear in your leaders. There are plenty of them. But God works instead to demonstrate his power through them, which is wonderful. <laughs> Good news for us. Fourthly, pray for your leaders. Don't always assume that they're going to respond in godly ways to the troubles, distress and suffering that comes. Pray they'll rejoice in their suffering, remember God's purposes in it, and serve in the strength that God provides. That's how it applies to church members. How does it apply to church leaders? Well, to pastors, certainly also to elders, pastoral team, ministry leaders in the church. There are four things in this as well. Again, one, praise and thank God. That's the primary application of this passage. This is the way he's designed all of this to work, and it does. Secondly, expect to suffer in ways that make us more useful. Christ himself, remember, was made weak, uh, like and tempted, like his brothers, in order that he might help those who are weak and tempted. Hebrews 2, 16 to 18 tells us that. And in the same way, God allows us to suffer at times in order to help us serve the church better. Let's not fight that off. Let's not despise our sufferings. They're not for nothing and they won't be in the future. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've looked back at even hard times in my life and whether out of hurt or regret, um, wished it hadn't happened. Some experiences were suffered, of course, because of my own sin. Some experiences suffered because of someone else's. But God makes the former forgivable and the latter useful. Uh, no more, more than that, beneficial. Because God's grace takes... Even things like the fretful and frightening experience of the kid living in the turbulent whirlwind of an alcoholic dad and gives him an understanding of where sin leads so he can serve others better. And thank God for it. And God's grace takes the 42-year-old's disappointment in his ongoing struggle with anger and turn it into perseverance in personal prayer and in ministering graciously to the struggling member who can't shake off a particular vice of their own and be fine with it. Whatever our struggle is, don't despise it. We might well miss the purpose of God and the mystery of his providence that he has for it in making much of Jesus. Thirdly, expect to be comforted in ways that bring you joy. Besides Jesus himself, glorious in himself, Paul seems to have suffered more than anyone else in ministry has suffered, but I've never read of anyone who rejoiced as much as Paul did. God's comfort and God's purposes, the knowledge of God's purposes, are key to that joy. And fourthly, expect to be used in ways 
that bring others joy. I mean, all our suffering has ministry potential. All of us, as we suffer, are vehicles of God's comfort. There's a lot of potential energy and comfort and love and care wrapped up in our experience and ready to be shared. So, praise God. The comfort God pours into pastors and church leaders has a purpose, to serve us like that champagne pyramid. Praise God that the trouble he won't remove as well from pastors also has a purpose. This is point two. It's to make us rely on him. If you look with me at verses 8 to 11, in this section, Paul gives us um, an example of the trouble that he himself has experienced. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. Now, I've got a picture to go with this point, too, before we follow, <coughs> excuse me, the flow of verses 8 to 11. And I want to say, pastors serve best when wrung like chamois leather. Okay, I know this sounds so bizarre, right? But anyway, bear with me. You know what chamois leather is, right? If you're washing your car, and if you let your car dry in the sun after washing it, you get those dry, kind of, they're not lime scale, but it's lime scaly looking deposits all over it, right? You prevent that by drying the car well with a chamois, right? But no chamois is big enough to dry an entire car. A chamois works best when you wring it out regularly. You get the water out by wringing it hard, not so hard that you ruin it, not so hard that you rip it, but hard enough that you can use it again to good effect. Now that's the effect I reckon God intends suffering to produce in those who serve as church leaders. God brings church leaders really to an end of themselves through suffering so that they rely on him. Now that's what we find in verses 8 and 9 when Paul describes what is essentially a near-death experience for him. We're not told exactly what happened, we don't need to know that. We only know that it happened in Asia, somewhere in modern day Turkey, and to know how he felt, how it felt. <clears throat> now, when you look at the terms that Paul used to describe it, it's fascinating. Verse A talks about great pressure, and here a word is used, it's used to describe an overloaded ship taking on water, or um, a camel or a donkey that's lost its legs under the weight of what it's carrying. Of the, of the burden it's carrying, okay? It's great pressure, hard to bear, right? Then in verse 8b, he talks about this pressure being far beyond their ability to endure. So this isn't something that he felt he could just ride out in his own strength, whatever this suffering was. No, nor was it a, a situation anyone that he knew could prevent. That's what leads to what we see in verse 8 at the end and to 9, we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we'd received the sentence of death. Now, this suffering so hard that Paul thought, well, that's it. His time is up. This is him being well and truly wrung out. But Paul was brought to the end of himself. And verse 9b to 10 tell us why. This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Now, that's the purpose God has had for Paul's suffering. To help him, the great apostle even, to rely on God. Not in himself. And that was a danger. Self-reliance is a curse in Christian life and ministry, even for people like the great apostle Paul. God used his suffering as he uses ours to awaken or increase our reliance on him, the only one who's truly strong and truly able to save. And he is the God who raises the dead. He's the one who is truly reliable. Now notice the tense in this section. Uh, the grammaticians will love this. This God talks about, uh, Paul talks about uh, God who raises the dead, not in a past tense. He doesn't say God who raised Christ, though he did that gloriously. 
it's present continuing. He's the God who is still raising the dead. But in what way? Like, does Paul mean this figuratively? Well, probably because that was Paul's experience. He didn't actually die. He just felt like his time was up. But if he was so near death that to be rescued from it, it felt like a resurrection. But in reality, it is also true. Paul is more certain of this, it seems, having suffered than he would have if he hadn't. Being in that, that um, feeling like he had received the sentence of death and having no hope that he would be rescued from it made him depend on God all the more. Now there's an additional purpose sneaked in here. To a church that's recovering from the deceit of these kind of Jewishy Ted talking braggers, a church that has almost winced at Paul's sufferings as something unseemly or weak or cursed by God. How could he possibly be an apostle of God and so important in the kingdom if he's suffering this way? But Paul invites them to join him in prayer at the end of this section. For what? For ongoing deliverance and ongoing sufferings. It's very clever. It's a gentle reminder to them that he and they, as they follow Christ, will share in his sufferings, as he says in verse 5. And also, that as they do, they will share in God's comfort and God's deliverance. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks in our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in answer to the prayers of many. So Paul says, the more people we have asking God to deliver us from the hard things that we'll experience on account of his name, the more people will have thanking and praising God when he actually does deliver. Because he definitely does. It's very good. It's very clever. Now, how do we apply this? What does this passage say to church members? Well, first of all, praise God. That's the primary application of this entire section in verses 1 to 11. Praise God for these reasons. Praise God for helping the leaders who serve you rely on him more as he delivers them from troubles. This is God's kindness to the churches. Uh, a church member's faith in God will be greater if that pastor's reliance on God is greater. There's a linked effect in here. Secondly, rely on God. God uses suffering in our lives to help us rely on him in the same way that he does in ministry, uh, for those in ministry. And self-reliance is dangerous. No one is strong enough to deliver themselves. We need to rely on God, all of us, the God who raises the dead and has the power to deliver us when he wills, as he does. Now, I do want to add that this reliance in God applies as much to the times when suffering lingers longer than we would like. I mean, God didn't remove Paul's affliction straight away. He took him to a point of, well, despair and distress. And God doesn't promise to remove ours instantly either. But in his good purposes, he is, in those sufferings, shaping us and our faith. And he is preparing us to use it, to minister those lessons and that faith to others. Thirdly, pray for your pastors. You're helping them in their ministry by praying for them. You know, whether you're a Susan or a Charlie, fed up with the guy you've got, or a young man in May, served well by the guy you've got, pray for your pastors and help them be all that God wants them to be. Use passages like Acts 20 or 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2 and 3. Turn those texts into prayers for them. Anything they do that's good as well, anything praiseworthy that's achieved, give thanks to God. Because anything like that is, as Paul calls in verse 11, gracious favour granted in answer to the prayers of many. Anything good in your pastors is not their doing. It's God's and he deserves the glory. That's how it applies to church members. How does it apply to church leaders? Well, three quick things. One, we praise God. He loves us enough not to leave us as we are, but to make us more effective in the ministry he calls us to do. And while he does that in all the positive ways of education, encouragement and joy, he does it just as much in our experience of darkness when we're being wrung and made ready for use again. Secondly, 
rely on God. I don't think I know a single pastor who would say, I'm totally self-sufficient in ministry, I've got it made. I'm competent in myself to do this. It's much more common to hear pastors express the opposite. We know our insufficiency for the task largely, but can I ask, as I ask myself, do you pray? I think prayerlessness in all likelihood betrays that we're more self-reliant than we realise. We do the tasks more than we get on our knees. That's dangerously self-reliant. Please would you pray for me in this and all of us in pastoral ministry and church leadership in the church family that we would be people of prayer. Thirdly, I, I guess I've just done it, invite people to pray for you. In our church family, I'm so grateful that many do. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for the way in which you pray for those in leadership and life of the church. But church leaders, we need to be much better at inviting more and more people to pray and to fuel their prayers, make them help people to pray more specifically so that in the end, the amount of thanksgiving that goes to God greatly increases. More praise to him through more people praying is good because God is the one who does the work. If you're watching this and you're not a Christian, I wonder how this sounds listening in. I wonder how you cope with suffering. I wonder if you've ever been brought to that point where with the Apostle Paul, you've, you've, maybe, you've maybe kind of experienced suffering in some way that's brought despair. Or maybe you're really afraid of the time when that will happen. Maybe a time when you yourself will approach death and you worry about what's next. Can I encourage you to get in touch and ask us about this so that we can point you to the Lord Jesus Christ about whom this passage speaks. The one who suffered on our behalf. The one who was delivered not from that death but through death by God the Father himself raised up to new life, having died for the sins of those who put their trust in him, so that we might know forgiveness, so that we might know his presence with us, so that we might know his comfort and his help in times of trial. If you don't know him, put your faith and trust in him. Confess your sins and come to Christ. He alone is our strength. <laughs>
Amen. Uh, yeah, it is by faith, by faith alone, uh, faith in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, if you're not a believer, if you don't, uh, if you wouldn't say that you've placed your faith, your trust in Jesus, but you are keen to find out more, and there are many that have done uh, over this lockdown period, they've got in touch with us, we'd encourage you to do that as well, please. Um, email us info at charlottechapel.org and, and somebody will get back in touch with you. We'd love to begin a conversation, maybe start reading the Bible with you. Uh, and so uh, please do get in touch. Again, brothers and sisters, um, if you're struggling, if you want prayer, please we'd encourage you to, to, to get in touch that we might pray for you, that we might get alongside you uh, and, and love you. Um, very often we finish our church services with... Uh, the word of God, often called uh, a benediction. And it's just a great either promise or statement or truth for us to uh, head into uh, the week with. And so I'm going to read to us from 1 Timothy, just a great truth about our God, about who he is. 1 Timothy uh, 1 verse 17 says, Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week. We'll see you soon.